Good morning, everyone. We have a lot to get through this morning with our modeling update, details on new long-term care guidance, and some updates from Dr. Levine, so I'll be brief. As you'll hear from Commissioner Pichek, many of our neighboring states continue to see an increasing number of cases, which is not unexpected and something most states have been predicting as we headed into fall. And as we presented each week, our own modeling predicted an increase in cases here in Vermont as well. But thankfully, we do not expect a large increase, and it's very much in our hands to keep our numbers down and continue to lead the nation in this regard. So again, I want to encourage all Vermonters to think carefully about the number of activities you're involved in, the number of people you come in contact with, and ask you to try and limit those to as few as possible. But if you find yourself in a situation where that's not possible, it's important to follow our simple guidance. Wear a mask, keep six feet apart, and try to keep those gatherings outdoors as much as possible. And, as we've been saying, get a flu shot. I think it's important to lead by example. So Dr. Levine, Secretary Smith, and I did in fact get our flu shots this morning. And I would encourage everyone who can to have one. Even if you've never gotten one before, this is the year to do it. It's an important part of keeping the capacity of our healthcare system open in order to care for COVID patients if needed, as well as protect our healthcare workers. As you all know, protecting the vulnerable in our long-term care and other similar facilities has been a top priority for us during the pandemic. And unfortunately, this has required a lot of sacrifice from our seniors and their families. The Agency of Human Services and Department of Health teams have been working on new guidance for these facilities, which Secretary Smith will detail shortly. I know this remains difficult for all of us, but especially for those who have not seen family members for months. But we have an obligation to protect them and the staff, and we take this very seriously. So we're going to continue to proceed with caution. With that, an update from Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. I want to talk a little bit about changes to uh, long-term care guidance. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, what is uh, commonly called CMS, issued new regulatory guidance to our CMS certified nursing homes related to both testing requirements and indoor visitation. In response, Dale, VDH, and an industry subgroup worked together to develop new guidance documents which supersedes the restart guidance issued to our long-term care facilities in July. If you remember in July we had various phases that you would go through uh, in order to obtain uh, different visitation uh, d different visitation policies. This new guidance document, which is based on the requirements set forth by CMS, will be effective as of yesterday. Uh, this includes testing requirements. Staff testing requirements are linked to county level positivity rates. So even at the lowest um, level imagined by CMS, below 5%, within a county, staff must still be tested at least monthly, and we are doing that here in Vermont. Should there be increasing rates of positivity levels in counties, the frequency of staff testing would increase. For example, if it's over 5%, then it is weekly. If it is over 10%, it is twice a week. Additionally, this new guidance addresses indoor visitation. For nursing homes with 0 to 10 percent county positivity rates, indoor visitation will be allowed with strict parameters. Now remember, Vermont is within uh, under 5 percent positivity rate, so these guidelines would pertain. Uh, to um, long-term care facilities or skilled nursing facilities in Vermont. Should county positivity uh, rates increase beyond 10 percent, 
only outdoor visitation or compassionate care visits will be allowed. And should there be a positive, if should there be a positive uh, case in a facility, visitation will be suspended except for compassionate care. It is important to remember that increasing visitors to a facility will increase the risk of potential virus transmission. Our guidance takes the requirement uh, to allow indoor visitation and create strict and specific guardrails to define how to conduct indoor visitation as safely as possible. Facilities will be held to high standards and visitors will be held to the same high standards. We know that an inability to see family and loved ones has had an impact on our long-term care residents. We want to ensure that we address that impact while still keeping our long-term care residents safe. CMS defines core principles for infection prevention, which must be adhered to throughout any visit. Those include visitor screening, physical distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfecting practices, and use of PPE. Additionally, this guidance sets guardrails for those that visit. They include limits on the number of visitors at any given time, that would be two, scheduled visit times, collection of contact information for all visitors, appropriate quarantining for any visitor prior to a visit. If you're coming from out of state and you're not in a green zone, the same sort of quarantining has to take place before you visit a facility. And other strategies to create the safest possible environment for all residents and facility staff. This will be a huge change for our long-term care facilities. And we encourage all that are anxious uh, family members to be patient as they work to adapt, adopt uh, these new expectations and continue to prioritize the health and safety of your loved ones. I also wanna just sort of update you. I've done it a little bit um, on prior press conferences on adult day, uh, working with the health department and adult day programs. At the end of September, we did publish guidance uh, Dale did uh, uh, publish guidance for how adult day programs can open safely. Uh, we agreed to a soft launch and not make any big announcement to avoid them feeling uh, all sorts of pressure. Uh, each will decide when and how they will reopen and are when they're ready to reopen and to begin to serve their participants. The most vulnerable of these participants might not be coming back immediately as they would present too big of a risk. Also, most will continue some form of telehealth as they reopen physically. Each program within the guidance needs to create their own reopening plan, addressing their own facility and program. Those need to be submitted to Dale for review. In the guidance itself, we address physical space, the water, climate control, number of participants per square feet, face coverings, where and how to use them, how to handle drop off and pickups of participants, daily health screenings, cleaning and disinfection, strategies for physical distancing in a congregate setting, how to handle personal care for participants, food preparation and service, transportation, and we make note of available resources as well in the guidance. And I'll be happy later on to answer any questions on uh, long-term care facility guidelines. Next up is uh, Commissioner Pichek on the, the weekly update. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Smith, and good morning, everyone. Um, this morning we'll start with an overview of some of the national uh, updates, uh, then turn to our regional update, Vermont-specific data and modeling, uh, and then close with an update uh, on our travel map. Again, for those who are watching at home, you can always find our presentations at dfr.vermont.gov. Um, today's presentation as well as past presentations are available there. Turning now to our first slide, this is a 14-day overview of the entire country, uh, areas where cases are continuing to increase and those where 
uh, they are performing better. The story is pretty similar here. Uh, there are parts of the Great Plains and the Midwest that are continuing to see large amount of cases, uh, while the Northeast is performing well comparatively to those parts of the country. However, as we'll get into in a minute, cases are still going up in the Northeast, and um, maybe just as alarming, so are hospitalizations across the country, uh, but also in the Northeast as well. We've also, as a country, uh, surpassed 50,000 cases per day on a seven-day moving average, um, and that last time we have done that was in the middle of uh, August. So cases are going up nationally. We are seeing that regionally as well, um, but uh, as I said, the hospitalizations are also a concern. If you go to that census region slide, we'll see that in the past, the story had been that particular parts of the country were seeing increases, particularly the south and the west over the summertime. Right now, you can see almost each census region is going up, uh, although slightly. Uh, we are seeing increases across the board, um, across the country to some degree. So that is a little bit different um, than what we saw over the summertime. Going ahead to the regional data, uh, you'll see here that um, last week, if you remember, we had almost a 50% jump in cases from about 16,000 to 24,000. Uh, this week, the case numbers have gone up, although very mildly compared to last week, up about 3%. I will note that testing across the region was down about 10% this week uh, compared to last week, so that might be a factor as well. And also, um, the state of Rhode Island has not updated its data uh, since last Friday, so there is some missing uh, data that's normally in here. However, all of that still being the case, cases are still rising uh, week over week uh, in the region and something uh, that we're going to continue to keep a close eye on and something that has impacted our travel map as well. You'll see here the, the overview since the beginning of the pandemic of that week over week case growth. Certainly still, as was the case last week, the growth is much more mild than it was back at the beginning of the pandemic, um, particularly this week, just being up over 3%. Um, it has slowed down, but it has gone up from an even higher base. So again, something that we need to continue to keep a close eye on uh, around the region and how that will impact uh, Vermont. Turning to the regional heat map, I think this will be illustrative to put these cases um, on the map so that they're not just accounted for as a state, but it shows you in those states where the cases are really uh, cropping up. You'll see on a per capita basis, just like in March and April, the cases are primarily located in that New York City metro area along the coastline in Connecticut, uh, up to Rhode Island and Boston, and then some as well uh, in southern New Hampshire. So they're not necessarily right on the Vermont border, but we are seeing increases in upstate New York and western New York as well. So again, dead data that we're going to have to keep a really close eye on uh, over the ensuing weeks. Turning now to our Vermont data, uh, similarly, we did see an increase um, relative to our low summer case counts, uh, but we did see a decrease compared to last week, uh, 58 cases uh, compared to 72 last week. Um, but if you do add up those two weeks, uh, it was the highest total case count that we've had uh, since the early part of June. So again, we're seeing some you know, movement in cases, as the governor mentioned. Um, our modeling was predicting that with more mobility, uh, with people uh, being uh, able to go back to work because their children are in school, uh, that that was um, a probable outcome. And we are seeing it show up some, to some degree uh, in our case counts. All of that being said, uh, we are still uh, the lowest uh, state per capita for a seven-day infection rate. Uh, we just beat out Maine, uh, so we continue to have the lowest infection rate in the country on a seven-day average, the lowest since the beginning of the pandemic. And if you look at the number of PCR positive cases that have come back, we also uh, rank uh, number one in that regard as well. So our numbers, again, trending very favorably to the region and the country, but they're just higher compared to what we've experienced in Vermont recently. On the uh, restart metrics, these are all trending well. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on them since they are uh, all trending in a favorable direction. Uh, the positivity rate, as I said, is still very low. The growth rate is not sustained, it's not a concern. Uh, syndromic surveillance remains relatively low. And in terms of hospitalization, we fortunately don't have anyone in the hospital today with COVID-19 across the entire state. So uh, positive news on all fronts there. Turning to uh, the next slide, this is just uh, an overview uh, of testing per capita that is going on in, in the country. Um, this is from the beginning of the pandemic, and this is based on uh, PCR tests that are conducted, and the data comes from the CDC. 
And it really shows how much Vermont has uh, increased its testing from the beginning of the pandemic and now uh, ranks number sixth in the country on a per capita basis. Um, but really, um, really stands out both in terms of that increase you see around college reopening, but then that sustained increase that has uh, maintained over the last month or so. So again, this is really positive news in terms of where our cases are and how much testing is going on. Um, both of those things are important for us to keep in mind. Getting to our most recent uh, modeling forecast, you will see, as we mentioned, the cases are expected to slightly go up over the rest of the month and into November. This had been anticipated for a number of weeks, although our case counts had st stayed relatively low. Um, again, nothing that is a cause for concern, but certainly uh, is a good reminder for us to continue to adhere to all the uh, public health guidelines to keep the case counts as low as possible. An example of four states that we have referred to on a number of occasions during these updates is a good example of what can happen uh, if you don't keep your case counts low or people start to uh, you know, get a little lax on the, on the uh, health guidelines. Uh, these are four states that we've compared in the past, Vermont, uh, Hawaii, Alaska, and Montana. You can see from the beginning part of the pandemic, we had very similar trajectories uh, from March to June. We all had a mild peak and then had really, really low case counts uh, for weeks and weeks, if not months. Um, but as we go to the next slide, you can see that that has played out much differently in August, uh, in September, and into October. Uh, all of the states other than Vermont have seen dramatic increases in their cases over the, that period of time. Some have started to come down, but you can see most recently Montana, which really has skyrocketed in the last few weeks. Um, and this really, these are three rural states other than uh, Vermont, which is rural as well. But it shows you how small rural states that are doing a good job containing the pandemic, you know, when things do um, loosen up a bit or people start to loosen up a bit, you can see cases grow quite substantially. So it's a good reminder, I think, for us in Vermont to be vigilant and continue um, to adhere to the guidance as best we can. A quick update on, on the flu vaccine and on education. You'll see that uh, on the next slide, we continue to beat last year's uh, flu vaccination rate compared to the same period in time. Uh, we're up uh, about uh, five or 6,000 uh, cases of people getting the flu vaccine. Uh, that's about nine and a half, nine and a half, 9.6% uh, increase compared to last year. Uh, so that is good news. Uh, we'd like to see, as Dr. Levine will mention, even more people getting their flu shot. Um, if we go to the next slide, You'll see that certain age groups are continuing to do a really good job with getting their flu shot, particularly younger and middle age and older individuals. But that cohort between 20 years old and early 30s uh, is down compared to last year. It's important for everyone to get vaccinated. So just another reminder uh, to do so. Turning to the education data, uh, looking across the northern New England region, cases in Vermont continue to stay really low. Uh, in New Hampshire, cases in schools are up over 100, uh, impacting uh, 68 schools. In Maine, similarly seen a number of uh, cases recently, 71 cases across their state. So considerably more cases in the other northern New England states than we're seeing currently in Vermont. Uh, in the higher education data, we remain very stable. We've had uh, 15,000 tests performed in the last week from higher education institutions, only four new cases. So 55 cases total um, compares, again, favorably to northern New England uh, as well. Finally, updating on the travel map. As I mentioned, our regional cases have gone up again for another week. And the fact that we've had high case counts across the region for two straight weeks factors into our methodology and uh, what counties are eligible for non-quarantine travel. Um, as you can see from the map, uh, much more red and yellow across the board than uh, even reported last week. Um, this uh, results in about 1.87 million people able to come to Vermont without a quarantine. It's down from about a million visitors from last week. Uh, last week, we were about 2.8 million. Um, you'll see also that the average uh, cases per million across the entire travel region is now 1,987. That's up from about 480 uh, at the beginning part of June. So across the travel region, you know, we're seeing uh, cases go up. Finally, on the last slide, you'll see those places that have switched from last week. Uh, not very many have flipped to green, but we have seen quite a few uh, counties that have flipped to either yellow 
or red. And again, just to mention that a number of them are across the Vermont border, either in New Hampshire or New York, to be vigilant about that for any uh, cross-county uh, or cross-state travel. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Levine. Just a quick uh, follow-up on flu vaccine, since that is a topic of concern this morning, as it will continue to be. I want to talk to those who may be ambivalent, who may be sitting on the fence, especially in that cohort that Commissioner Pichak talked about, 20s and 30s. I uh, just have a few comments. Because flu season is occurring this year, of course, during a pandemic, it really does mean it's more important than ever to get a flu shot. Flu shots can prevent medical visits. They can prevent hospitalizations. Even if you get your flu shot and you still get the flu, the vaccine can reduce the severity of the illness you will have and the symptoms you will have, and perhaps the number of days of symptoms as well. During the 2018 to 19 flu season, Vermonters were hospitalized due to flu more than 1,800 times, a statistic many of you may not be familiar with. So this year, it's important to limit any strain on our hospitals and our health care providers who, of course, are continuing to play a critical role in our COVID-19 response. By keeping flu out of the picture, we can avoid what I've termed this twindemic that we don't want to see. And we certainly don't want to see further PPE shortages and other resources being competed for by the flu uh, in addition to COVID-19. Things like ventilators, oxygen, ICU rooms. These are really critical to treating those who have severe cases of COVID. Moving to a couple other topics now. The Health Department is currently investigating several cases associated with four schools. South Burlington High School, Williston Central, Windsor School, and Manchester Elementary. All of whom have put out communications to their communities. You can find the number of cases for schools at our COVID-19 website. But remember that weekly updates are posted on Monday mornings, reflecting reports received by the previous Friday. This means some of the current investigations won't be reflected in the data until next week's presentation. We've not made any public health recommendations to close these schools or move to remote learning at this time. But as always, if the school makes such decisions based on state guidance and their own operational considerations, we support their decisions. Leaders at the schools have been helpful and we appreciate their communications to keep students, staff, teachers, and communities informed. I wanna emphasize that even this far into the school year, there have been no known instances of transmission of the virus in the schools. School-associated cases are among people who've been exposed to the virus in the community outside of school. In addition, we are investigating 12 new cases among people associated with hockey, both youth league and adult team members, all in the Montpelier Central Vermont area. Contact tracing is underway, and we do not yet know the connection between the youth and the adult players. The number of cases should be considered preliminary at this point and subject to change. Now, while we know that both the youth and adults practice at Central Vermont Memorial Civic Center in Montpelier, the exact mode of transmission is not yet clear. Whether it's even due to playing or practicing hockey or to activities incidental to the sport, such as carpooling to practices, travel to a game, team gatherings, group meals, or the like. Team rosters and schedules are being collected and a timeline is being developed 
and along with interviews and contact tracing will guide further recommendations. We are recommending testing for adult team members who participated in recent games. And the Youth Recreational Hockey League sent out a communication to all eight teams associated with this club to encourage players to get tested. We are not yet recommending testing for the community at large. A few of the youth players are included among cases in some of the schools I mentioned earlier. These schools use a pod structure, which has greatly facilitated contact tracing, quarantining, and local decision making. My last topic has to do with the fact that you may have heard that the University of Vermont had a special guest visit over the weekend. Dr. Deborah Burks, the Coronavirus Response Coordinator for the White House Coronavirus Task Force, came to UVM wearing a scarf as part of a national tour to gather information on best practices in higher education in the COVID-19 response. I think she told me she'd been to something like 37 states already and wanted to see uh, what constituted Vermont's response and its uh, reasons for success. Secretary Smith and I also were fortunate to have the chance to speak with Dr. Burks, and she was impressed with the college restart efforts, including comprehensive testing protocols and the positivity rate here in Vermont. She appreciated our surveillance testing of vulnerable populations and even suggested we find one or two other groups to test periodically. But she also shared some of her own thoughts with us about other areas of the country that are seeing increases in cases, specifically some of the states Commissioner Pichak talked about. One of the main concerns is travel. She noted the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic leaving Boston for northern New England and the full hotel rooms where she was staying. We managed to do well through the summer travel season, but we need to be even more careful about travel now with more activities moving indoors and with schools open. Dr. Burtz noted the experience of states like Wyoming and Montana, which used to have rates like ours. She attributes much of their increases to tourism and specifically to residents leaving the state for hotter zones and then returning back home with infection. She noted, similar to our Vermont data, that much COVID transmission occurs within households and close friends where trust is high. It's important that we do not fall into the trap of thinking that just because people are our close relatives or friends and we know them well, that we can know with certainty whether or not they've been exposed to the virus especially if they live in an area where incidence of COVID is higher than here. The likelihood of a transmission from asymptomatic individuals may also be high. That is why we have strict guidance for travel. So I remind you, please, please think about any travel plans carefully and check the travel map. If you have visitors, make sure they check it too. Unfortunately, as we just saw, there are a lot of yellow and red counties right now, and that does require that you quarantine, either for 14 days or with a negative PCR day on or after day seven of quarantine. This also goes for college students returning from other states to Vermont for the holidays. And remember what it means to quarantine, staying home and away from other people. Get someone else to do your errands for you and no social gatherings. We know it isn't easy, but unless we want this to go on and on, this is how we can limit possible spread of the virus together. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Calvin. Uh, thanks, so this might be a question for Commissioner Kuchek. You mentioned that um, North Dakota, for example, they have one of the highest testing per capita rates in the country, but yet they are one of the biggest spot zones right now. I'm wondering, I guess, just gather your thoughts on how that's possible and where that, that relationship is. Yeah, so certainly testing in cases have to 
you know, play a role with each other. Um, if you have really high cases and really low testing, that could indicate that maybe there's even more cases in your region than you're testing for. So the fact that North Dakota is doing a lot of testing, I mean, they are turning up a lot of cases. Uh, so that does definitely interplay with each other. So maybe their cases per capita uh, are a little higher because they're doing so much testing. Uh, but it's clear that it's quite significant, the situation that's happening in North Dakota and South Dakota, even with the amount of testing they're doing. And then I guess um, maybe this is more a question for the government, but so we're, if we're not mistaken, at our lowest point of some 1.8 million people allowed to come into the state right now. Um, at the peak of our, our fall foliage season, maybe a little past it. But I'm wondering, I guess, if you just have a sense of, of how this is going to impact our coffers, how it's going to impact our economy, uh, especially since people, people need this revenue. Yeah, there's no doubt that the pandemic itself has affected uh, our tourism sector. Uh, hospitality in particular, uh, with our restaurants and uh, lodging facilities. Um, I would say uh, that the peak of the season this, uh, this past weekend was probably it. Uh, we will see a uh, gentle, I think, uh, decline in the number of visitors naturally uh, over the next, uh, next month or so. And then, uh, and then I would imagine it would resume around Thanksgiving into December. So hopefully uh, other states will get their own numbers under control at that point and we can open up uh, to more travel into the state. Uh, but, uh, but I think we're just going to miss uh, that. I think uh, the timing was uh, actually appropriate for us and we should miss uh, the, the full brunt of that. So I, again, I think we're doing better than we thought we would. Uh, from a tourism standpoint, but uh, certainly the numbers are off uh, dramatically from a year ago. And then I guess uh, just to follow up, if we continue to see this, this trend of our numbers continuing to fall, I guess, what, what could that mean for the ski season? Well, again, hopefully uh, if uh, this, this wave uh, that's coming at us from into the Northeast uh, with a higher number of cases, uh, hopefully that declines over the next month or two and uh, we'll be able to get back to some sort of normalcy that we'll be able to welcome people in to, to ski. It'll look much different. I know we have, are having conversations uh, right now uh, with some of the, uh, the mountains and the ski areas and so forth uh, to determine uh, what, what provisions will be put into place. And I know they're taking a lot of those on themselves, learning from, their, from neighbors, from uh, some of the other facilities around the country. Um, but I'm, I'm confident we'll have a ski season, um, but it may not look the same as it did a year ago. Okay. Ross? Governor, uh, thank you. First, a uh, quick question uh, about the schools. With some cases now popping up at both elementary and high schools, and people here today about it connected to youth recreational sports. Uh, where's maybe the line for you with, with taking some more state level action on maybe instituting some more guidance or, or rolling back when schools are uh, allowed, how they're allowed to operate? Yeah, again, I think uh, what we've done so far uh, has precluded uh, the, uh, the uh, maybe shutting down or, or revision of some of the guidance. Uh, I think we're in pretty good shape in some respects when you look at uh, what we're experiencing versus maybe other states. So uh, we've done very well. So being able to uh, to actually uh, switch from remote to in person and so forth and a hybrid approach has taught us how to do that. And uh, so it may not be necessary to impose any more guidance than we have today. For the edge, a, a slightly different topic. I'm curious if you've gotten a chance to fill out the, the NAACP's candidate report card. I know that was sent out to everyone the ballot this year. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I actually don't have the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're going to move the phones now. Aaron Patenko, VT Digger. Aaron, VT Digger. I heard Dr. Levine. Hi. Go ahead, Aaron. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I heard Dr. Levine mention war schools uh, with uh, case investigations going on 
Uh, I also heard that um, Essex Bedford School District announced a K to Essex Elementary School. Um, would that bring the total number of schools with cases under investigation up to five? Yes. Dr. Levine? Yes, you are correct. Okay. Um, and that, just that that hasn't yet been added to the total announced on the website or anything like that? No, that's uh, very, very, very recent news. Okay. Um, we're also hearing from um, some teachers that expressing concern that teachers are not considered, or, or just anyone who's in the room with a student, would not necessarily be considered a close contact for the purposes of contact tracing these positive cases. So could you give some clarification about what makes someone a close contact in those circumstances? Absolutely. Um, so the traditional definition of close contact has to do with the distance and the duration of contact. So we talk about the six feet, as you're quite aware, and we talk about 15 minutes of close contact. We, um, as part of contact tracing, um, interview lots of people, and we get a sense uh, in terms of the facility for how long uh, students and teachers are together for periods of time. There are situations where a teacher and a class may be together for much of the day, um, which certainly would, would, would be concerning in terms of a close contact. There are other situations where there may be a short duration class or two, and the students are shuffling in and out of a different room, and that may not be. Every instance is an individual instance, so we have to really look at it case by case to know if we should tell a teacher to be quarantining or not and uh, alert them to their level of risk. Um, I, I would want to be reassuring to teachers uh, because we, we look at schools obviously very, very seriously when we know of a case, whether it's a teacher or a staff or a student, and we do our best to make sure that we understand who's really in the closest contact with the uh, index case and who may have had more peripheral contact that wouldn't warrant any alarm or quarantine situation. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, I have another question for the governor. Um, the auditor released a report today uh, urging the Green Mountain Care Board to consider the affordability of health care. Um, have you had a chance to look at the report and do you have a response to it? Um. No, if he released it today, I was busy getting a flu shot and preparing for this press conference, so I have not seen that. Okay. Um, do you have any concerns about the affordability of health care in Vermont? Yes. Um, is that something that you're considering pursuing or, or you it, know, yeah. campaigning on in terms of, it, you know, every your day, every day, or, campaign out of? Yeah. yeah. Every day we are concerned about the affordability of health care and the affordability of Vermont. And uh, we are taking steps uh, every day to try and make it more affordable. I, I would ask Secretary Smith, he might be able to answer that. Maybe he's seen the report. Thanks, Aaron. I had heard the report ha has come out. I haven't, I haven't read it yet. Um, and uh, I think it actually came out yesterday morning, but I'm not sure yet um, when it came out. Um, affordability, we talked about reboot of the all-payer model. Certainly affordability is a huge part of that aspect. You have sort of three, a three-legged stool with uh, health care. You have affordability, which you have to make sure that you, uh, you focus on. You have access which you have to focus on, and you have quality that you have to focus on. So affordability is a major part of what we're looking at as we look forward in um, what I would say is the reboot of, uh, of the all-payer model. Okay, Aaron, I think we need to move on. Ed Barber. Yes, good morning. Good morning. 
I'm, I'm, uh, my question this week is with the economy still partly shut down um, with the tremendous loss we've had in tax revenues, uh, rooms and meals and sales tax, um, are there any projections that you're working with right now to see what's going to happen for next year's budget? And are there things you're looking at to try to mitigate the impact it would have on our uh, property taxes this year, this next year? Yeah, Ed, uh, both good questions. And uh, we are concerned, obviously, uh, about those revenues. Uh, and I'm sure that in your region in particular, um, with the border being shut down, you haven't seen as much uh, cross, and maybe not at all, uh, cross border um, revenue of uh, those coming from Quebec in particular. Um, we, uh, we have made projections uh, for this, uh, this budget that we're in right now that will end uh, the end of uh, end of June. And uh, we have, uh, we're working with our economists, on, with the legislature, on projections for the following year uh, to the, the next fiscal year. So um, uh, again, too early to tell. Uh, a lot uh, will depend on Congress and what will happen with the next stimulus package. I believe uh, the president announced that he was willing to, uh, to move forward with a, a stimulus package. The House uh, has passed one. Uh, the Senate uh, hopefully will take one up. Uh, and um, we'll have something uh, that we can we can rely on because we're going to need some help uh, with stimu uh, stimulating the economy over the next uh, few months. So again, a lot of um, there's a lot of potential, um, but uh, we'll continue to work, uh, move forward. We'll build a budget uh, that I'll present in January uh, that will be balanced and uh, we'll live within our means. But but hopefully we'll receive some help from uh, from Congress in order to accomplish that. Okay, did you, though, from the last stimulus, was there money that they were, you were able to directly target the federal funds uh, to help offset the property tax burden? Uh, no, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's work, right. You guys did some work we're quiet about, and you hadn't had a ruling at the time. Right. No, uh, the guidance uh, wasn't, uh, we were hoping for more flexibility. Um, that still could happen, uh, to be honest, Ed, but, uh, but at this point it has not happened. Congress has not taken any action on uh, giving the states more flexibility in some of the CARES money. So we have, um, we have presented uh, options for the CARES money, but if they were to come back in the next couple of weeks, we might be able to shuffle money around um, to try and help uh, in other sectors. So. Time will tell. Um, we have to be nimble, uh, and uh, but at this point in time, we've appropriated all the CARES money. But I believe there may be some uh, left over, or if they give us more, more flexibility and guidance, we'll we'll go back to work and see if we can uh, find some room uh, in areas of need. Thank you very much. Yep. Wilson Ring, EAP. Um, morning, everybody. Um, I'm curious what you make of these uh, growing red and orange counties. They seem to be uh, moving in on Vermont, and obviously we've seen the number of people who can come here go down and, and continue to go down. Um, might at some point you need to do something to be a little more uh, strict on who I don't know how this would attempt to do it, um, but whether people who come in quarantine, that seems to be pretty much an honor system. And I wonder how well you think that is working, and if anything can or might have to be done about that. Yeah, Wilson, it's not, uh, you know, I've talked about this uh, a number of times. We don't have a perfect system, uh, nor do I know what the perfect system is, uh, to be perfectly blunt. Uh, we can't shut down our borders. Uh, we can't check papers as they uh, come across the border. Uh, so we have to rely on some sort of honor system. Uh, and we've uh, incorporated a lot the lodging industry has been a great partner in uh, in trying to prevent some of the travel. Um, so we'll see uh, where we go from here. I'm hoping uh, that we've hit the peak. Uh, that uh, travel does seem to be uh, part of the part of the problem. So possibly we've hit the peak, and then uh, we will uh, the wave will will move on, uh, and uh, and not uh, and, and not prevent so many uh, of these uh, opportunities for us here in Vermont. We've thus far uh, have uh, have 
not seen uh, what other states have, and uh, we hope that uh, to be the case if we continue to follow the guidance and continue to prevent uh, some of the spread ourselves. I think that that's, uh, that's really important. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAX. I have a couple questions for Dr. Levine. First one is, why are you not recommending community testing yet for the central Vermont community? I know when past case clusters have popped up, that's led to pretty quick community pop-up testing sites. Are you finding those immediate pop-ups after a, a cluster of cases not really effective in catching new cases, or is it just something specific to this instance? No, it has, it has nothing to do with the value of, of the pop-ups. Um, it's just we're very, very early in the investigation, and we want to get an adequate handle on it to understand the value of the community pop-up in this particular instance. doesn't mean we won't be recommending it. I just wanted people to know that as of this early uh, juncture in time, we hadn't uh, been pushing for that immediately. You know, that part of it has to do with the likelihood of community spread from the uh, initial cases that are uh, discovered. And so once we've decided that, that will help a lot. I guess probably the better clarifying question for me at this point then is when did you first become aware of these, um, this cluster connected to hockey? Saturday and Sunday. Got it. Um, I, broader question here, are there similarities in the ways that people seem to be getting this virus? Um, I'm kind of thinking big picture here, like we see cases pop up here or there in Vermont. Are there any similarities that you can draw to the line to in specific behaviors that people had or specific um, ways they might have contracted the virus? Yeah, no, those are great questions. So um, in our weekly updates, uh, you know, we try to look at that uh, now and then to be uh, getting a handle on it. Um, one of the most uh, numerous ways people seem to get the virus is by being a household contact. So having somebody in the household who's a case and then one of the contacts who usually is quarantining um, becomes another case. Uh, that doesn't happen with high, high frequency if you're uh, a contact of a case, but it happens uh, to a large proportion, to account for a large proportion of uh, people who become cases. We also continue to recognize that people who have traveled um, and come back to the state um, are a significant source of that as well, um, because as Wilson just showed in his questioning uh, and the map showed this morning, uh, even if you're traveling regionally, um, there are a lot less places that you can go that aren't yellow or red um, if you're leaving Vermont and then coming back. So it has nothing to do with whether people are appropriately quarantining when they come back. It just has to do with the fact that they've put themselves at some risk, I'll put that in quotes, by going uh, to an area that has more prevalence of virus than we do. Uh, those are really the main ways that uh, we're looking at right now. Obviously, we have occasional uh, clusters or situations in various kinds of work sites or uh, long-term care facilities, what have you. But when we see those, they still generally represent people who in the community have either acquired the virus through a contact or through a travel situation. Got it, thank you. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good morning, Dr. Levine mentioned that Dr. Burke was dismayed to see the traffic in the full hotel as she traveled to UVM. I'm wondering if the state or VTrans or Commissioner Pichak has any detailed data on increases in out-of-state travelers over the last weekend. And is there any data that quantifies state-by-state, state, out-of-state visitors? Um, Lisa, I know that we, uh, we have a public-facing uh, dashboard from the Agency of Transportation that shows uh, the number of uh, people traveling in and out of the state uh, through some of the uh, ports of entry, uh, but it doesn't distinguish who's out-of-state and who's not, just kind of a relationship as to where we were a year ago. I believe uh, Commissioner Pichek might have information on the mobility as well. Thank you. 
Yeah, so Lisa, the, um, the mobility data is generally a week to 10 days behind, um, you know, the current date. So we don't have information yet for this past weekend. Um, I will say that it was um, generally the mobility was going up, but consistent with how mobility went up in previous years, so still down compared to 2019. Um, so it was going up, but still, you know, consistently down compared to the previous time point, 2019. And we can provide um, a further update once uh, we get more up to up real time data. Thank you, Commissioner Peter. And to follow up, Governor, you said that. With foliage tourism winding down, you hope to see a slowing of the increase in cases. How will winter tourism be different than foliage tourism? You mentioned you've been in conversations with the ski areas. Can you share any more about those plans? Yeah, um, I can't share. Right, I can't share any more about the plans because they haven't been uh, fully vetted at this point. Uh, I know they're working on this. Uh, in terms of what my hope is, uh, that the other states that we rely on, may, I mean, most of the the skiers uh, we we have in the state uh, come from uh, the driving public uh, from the surrounding states, whether it be New Jersey or, or Connecticut or Rhode Island and Massachusetts and New York. Um, so, if they're uh, you know we're all one big community. If their case numbers uh, drop, uh, they go back to green and they can travel into the state. Uh, again, uh, I think we'll be better protected, obviously, because uh, the virus won't be spreading. So that was my only point, uh, that at that point, my, my hope is uh, that other states surrounding us uh, will have a better, um, better experience in terms of the transmission of the virus. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning. Um, I think this question is either for Secretary Smith or Dr. Levine, or maybe even a combination. Um, I'm hoping that someone can give an update on the recent COVID test by a staff member at Northwestern Medical Center, uh, and curious what the state's guidance is to the hospital and how the state's been involved. Uh, maybe Dr. Levine. I'm not sure we have that information, but Dr. Levine. Greg, you're going to have to uh, illuminate a little more and, and help us understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, well, I, I understand that there was a positive test uh, in the last few days at, at Northwestern Medical Center by a, a staff member, possibly someone uh, in the emergency department. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what your knowledge is of this and, and guidance has been to the hospital. Uh, in responding to having uh, somebody who's worked with patients and, and other staff members test positive. Okay, so I really am not aware of the case you talk about. Um, and um, if the team is uh, and have dealt with it, that would be great. So we can get back to you on that. But let me broaden the discussion a little bit since you've given me the opportunity. Um, this would not be the first healthcare worker in any institution in the state that we've seen have a positive test. Um, so we actually have a lot of experience with it at this point in time. And because of the level of uh, attention every healthcare worker has given to the appropriate health guidance, and because of the uh, PPE and masking issues that they've all uh, complied with, we don't really have instances of the public either entering a hospital for admission or being there for other reasons um, and having an infection result because they entered a healthcare setting like a hospital. Uh, so the, the chance, again, of that happening is real, but it just has not been an issue in Vermont. When we looked at our total numbers of cases a few weeks ago on our weekly update, in Vermont, it turned out that one in six cases were with healthcare workers. So that's like you'd expect a higher risk profession if you're putting your own uh, health and security on the line every day by interacting with the public, some of whom may have the virus. Um, the good news is, though, that uh, we're aware of that. Uh, hospitals deal with it effectively. And we're not aware of any you know, major transmission going on within the facilities because of that. 
as I will continue to say and have said previously, every work setting you would want to go to and every education setting you would want to go to is but a microcosm of the community you live in. So if there are cases in the community that the healthcare workers live in and they don't spend 24-7 at the hospital and never leave, uh, they're going to have the opportunity, like the rest of us, to potentially um, come in contact with the virus. Um, and that's what this often is revealing. It's very unusual, actually, for them to be getting their positive test because they interacted with a patient who was hospitalized for COVID. It's much more that they've uh, come to work unwittingly, not having symptoms, and uh, tested positive. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I guess anything to help. Uh, do you have any sense of how many doctors in Vermont uh, have, have tested positive since we've been, begun this pandemic? Yeah, I don't. We, we've kind of lay, lumped them into a healthcare worker category, and I, I wouldn't want to, off the top of my head, guess at doctors versus nurses versus orderlies or what have you. Um, so I couldn't give you that exact number. I'm not sure we even have it, but if we do, uh, we will send it to you. It's going to be a small number, I can tell you that. Okay, and, and typically, what sort of response does the state have the hospitals when there is a is a positive test. It's my understanding that they've kind of ramped up their their PPE a little bit uh, to, to kind of more of a precautious level than they were at before. Is that standard? Is is, uh, is that guidance from the state? Are you, are you saying to contend to contend with the fact that there was a positive test? Well, it, it, it's my understanding that um, as they're trying to rule out uh, any spread to other coworkers, that they've increased the, the level of precautions that they're taking at the hospital. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the state has, has given guidance to other hospitals like that in the past. Yeah, the reality is I don't think a hospital can up its game much more than it is from baseline. Um, a positive case in a department in the hospital wouldn't necessarily precipitate a change in their approach to PPE, because I bet you their approach is, is actually fine. And again, you will find quite often, if not the majority of the time, that the hospital worker became positive because of something else going on in their life um, and someone else that they were exposed to. Um, and then when they found they were positive, they immediately were removed from the healthcare setting. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean there was a breakdown in PPE protocol that uh, enabled them to become a positive case. Okay. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll call that good. Uh, if you can follow up uh, with the other questions that I had as far as the numbers and uh, uh, whether the state's been involved with Northwestern on this case. Uh, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Greg. John Thank Dillon. Thank you, Dr. Bluvin. Thank you, Governor. John Dillon, VPR. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a question perhaps also for Dr. Levine um, about the Vermont Air Guard. Um, I didn't hear that those cases in, included in your, in your wrap-up. Um, do you have any concerns about the, the time lag in, in reporting those cases? Um, I read that the first was October 1st, um, and now we have eight people there uh, who have tested positive. Um, any concern about that? And I'm also curious about how you think this may have been transmitted. Um, thinking about your comment about travel, um, some of these some of these pilots obviously are traveling uh, and bringing planes to Vermont and wondering if that was um, potentially a, a, a transmission route. Yeah, let me try to handle all of those that I can remember you just asked. Uh, the very first case was reported on the 1st of October, actually two cases. Um, and then a large number of close contacts were tested on the following day. Um, and just so you'll know, we think the exposure was probably a week before, so that was a good day to be testing them. 
and that's when we found several additional cases uh, within a day of their test. So again, there, there really was no lag. If, if there was a lag at all, it was in knowledge about the first case, but you can't know about a case till they become symptomatic and get themselves tested. And that's exactly the way this went. And then over the ensuing several days, um, several more cases were reported. Uh, the guard, as you know, plays a big role in testing in the state, and they take testing really seriously. And if anything, they went above and beyond in terms of testing uh, their members uh, once they knew about the positive cases. Um, you're right to assume that there may have been some out-of-state work work site exposure, if you will, because these are pilots often who travel from state to state. But that doesn't mean that was the cause. It's just a hypothesis at this point in time. Um, the, the cases that we're aware of uh, tend to work in very close quarters with one another uh, due to the nature of their jobs um, and often in the same buildings. So um, there would be opportunity for cases to infect one another, if you will, while they were asymptomatic and unaware that they were harboring the virus. Um, I will say that um, the number of tests we've done is in the hundreds, uh, and we're not finding hundreds of cases in that uh, National Guard group, just a small number. So. Uh, that's kind of where things stand. I'm not concerned about any lag times. I think actually once this first case was uh, evident, the pace was rather rapid in terms of testing contacts, having other contacts be tested once new people became cases, and within a week actually getting a good handle on uh, who was infected, who wasn't. Thank you. And just to clarify, are those cases counted in Chittenden County numbers or, or where the Guard members live? How, how is that uh, calculated? So uh, the place of residence is usually the way we record the case, not, not, the, not the place of testing. Okay. Thank you. We, we record both, but in terms of what you'll find on the website. Joseph Bresser. Department Chronicle. I'm not sure who this question would be for, but um, when the CARES Act was passed, a lot of Vermont businesses received help um, through the um, Aero Protection Plan. And the idea of this was that money that was provided would start out as a loan, but if certain conditions were met, would be converted to uh, a grant. And obviously, the difference between the, the two states makes a lot of difference in a business's bottom line. What I'm curious about is whether uh, the requirements for conversion have been made clear and if anyone has any sense of how many Vermont businesses now know that what might have been uh, a loan now been converted into a grant. Um, yeah, great questions, uh, Joe. I know a number of Vermont businesses took advantage of the PPP and, uh, and I know that there was a little bit of uh, confusion uh, on the federal side as to what was uh, a grant or what was a loan um, in the aftermath. But I don't know if uh, Commissioner Goldstein or Secretary Curley are on the line and might be able to answer that more directly or at least get you the information uh, very soon. But I, I just don't have that off the top of my head. Yes, Governor, this is Secretary Curley. Um, I believe the question was um, there was confusion around the original federal grant about what would be loans or what would be grants, and are companies aware that they're actually grants at this point? Is that the question? I think uh, the question. The question is. Go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, the, the question from my end was uh, whether people have been informed if their grants have, uh, their loans have been converted to grants because 
you know, figuring out your bottom line at the end of the year um, would be harder if that were in the air. Yes, that's a great point. So, um, yes, I'll have to get that information for you since they are federal grants. Um, I would have to check with the SBA on that and find out what kind of communication has occurred between employers um, who have obtained those those federal loans slash grants. Um, but happy to take it offline and, and try to find that answer for you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, I had a question uh, from Dr. Levine about the uh, Boston University mortality study that came out last week. But just to be clear on the learn long-term care home visitation, both people coming into the state and those visiting uh, out of state from Vermont, they still have to follow the same um, travel guidelines that everyone else would have to. That That's correct? Yeah, that's correct, Tim. Okay. For the that mortality study, there's it seems like there's the second this is the second study which is indicating a much higher in this case over 30 percent higher incidence of mortality related to COVID. Even though it's not, it might not show up on the death certificates, would push the national uh, total number of deaths to about 300,000. And I was wondering, uh, Doctor, what your take on those studies and what that data, and if it makes even really any difference to what you're doing. Thanks for the both parts of the question. So, you know, I do think we should look at studies like that and take them seriously, um, not because um, the higher number supports more of what we do and uh, takes away some of the uh, people who say that this is not real and we're not really in a pandemic. Um, I mean, it is more impressive. But I think the bigger issue it raises um, it's two issues, really. One is, is COVID actually causing more deaths? And the second is, are we actually seeing more deaths in our society um, be, in the setting of COVID, not necessarily all connected with COVID, but somehow related to the fact that people are in a pandemic? For instance, during that huge period of time when people were not leaving their homes, and perhaps neglecting serious medical issues or serious symptoms uh, that took a toll on them as time went on and they end up as a death, certificate, death statistic eventually. Um, that's where the studies like the ones you described are a little harder to pin down because the data is the data, but you have to have some hypotheses about why the data looks the way it is. And sometimes it's because they're undercounting COVID. Other times it's because being alive during COVID made somebody behave differently and impacted their overall health and lifespan. So that's a real challenge. The good news for Vermont and why it doesn't impact uh, me too much in what we've designed in Vermont and what we're following through with in Vermont is we're really, really aware of uh, deaths in Vermont and I think take great pains to make sure that if there was even a potential relationship to COVID, that we've explored that. You know, the chief medical examiner has been following protocols all throughout this, where uh, they'll even obtain additional testing or recommend when they hear about a case um, that may have occurred at a nursing home or whatever to just get a COVID test before the death certificate is finalized so that if COVID could have played a role that we're aware of that and it's really important for the rest of the facility to know as well. As well. So I don't see it having as huge an impact on um, our behavior in Vermont necessarily because we're pretty confident about our numbers and we've actually <clears throat> taken great pains to cast a wide net and make sure that even if COVID wasn't the one moment cause of death, but it was involved in what built up to that death, that we consider it and include it in the statistics. All right, great. Well, that was uh, really thorough. Thank you very much. Mike Donahue, The Islander. <clears throat> Thank you, Ethan. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, Governor Scott mentioned the uh, daily concern by him and 
his administration for the affordability of health care for Vermonters. Doctor, I'm wondering what your health department is doing to help Vermonters that do not have health insurance or are not working without paying for the flu shots that you're asking for people to get. Uh, obviously, one of our readers just sent me a note saying $100 is a, or so is a considerable expense. And you multiply it by the family members, and they have to make the decision about buying food, paying rent, heating bills. So what can you do in your health department to make flu shots affordable for Vermonters? Yeah, let me say for the, from the outset, if that person really feels they were unjustly billed for something that shouldn't have happened or um, somehow didn't have any insurance they have accessed for the shot, that they should connect with uh, us and we can direct that to the appropriate part of the Agency of Human Services. Um, but getting to your broader question, um, specifically dealing with someone uninsured, the number one thing our health department has done, and it's tradition and it continues to do, is that you can show up at our district health office, preferably you call and make an appointment, uh, and you can get a uh, flu vaccine at the district health office uh, with full knowledge that you are uninsured and would have had to pay for it if you went to another setting. And how many district offices do you have and where are they? We have 12, um, and there's one in every district of the state. So um, I would uh, ask the uh, listener who's concerned uh, to just go to our website, and they'll be readily evident. Great. Thanks very much. And one quick question for Commissioner Harrington, if he's on the line today. Uh, one of our readers in Burlington reported that after being laid off and getting unemployment, uh, apparently like last week maybe when answering the regular questions, a new one popped up. Uh, they apparently uh, were asked, did you look for work as directed? And the person said apparently that the obligation to job plan had been rescinded during the pandemic. Has that, quest or has, has that requirement been reinstated? Uh, the person said they called and emailed but couldn't get an answer from their office. Uh, what's the status on needing to look for work? Sure, Mike. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, so it's interesting. I've heard this uh, only twice probably over the past um, eight or ten months that um, two different cases where people thought it was a new question. I had circled back with our team and we actually did not take the question down because it's a, it's a required question to ask, although um, we certainly know that people are, you know, we're considering them able and available to work but for um, the pandemic. Uh, I'll circle back with the team to see whether that um, had come off one of the applications and was inadvertently added back on but or, or had been on all along um, just to get some clarity around that. But, the last time I checked on it, it had not been removed due to it being a required question, um, and um, but it was not stopping someone's claim uh, from going through. Um, so I will I will double check on that to see whether it, it got added back to our claimant portal. Um, there is uh, to to your overall question about um, uh, people looking for work. I you know. There is no formal directive uh, for uh, called work search that people have to conduct each week as they did prior to the pandemic. Certainly, I'll put a plug in that, um, you know, if there's nothing preventing you from searching for work, um, that you're doing so because we know there are businesses who are uh, looking to hire uh, and there are jobs out there. Uh, we certainly understand that there are more people right now who are unemployed um, than there are jobs. And that has been one of the key determining factors and whether we turn uh, the work search back on. Um, but I would certainly say if someone is is able and available to return to work, much would be that they're, they're reaching out and, and looking for possible employment opportunities. Because we do have businesses that are, are looking to reopen um, or staff up, uh, and there is a shortage of, of workers right now looking. Great. Thank you very much as well. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Guy Page. My 
first question, I think, is for Commissioner Levine. Um, you mentioned the eight months, 2018, 2019 flu season saw 1,800 hospitalizations. Your website's annual report doesn't have mortality figures for that season. Can you tell us those? And also, by comparison, how many Vermonters have been hospitalized during the first seven months of the COVID-19 pandemic? They're asking me for numbers that I know we have, but I don't have at the top of my head. Um, so the mortality rate for that flu season, and then the number of hospitalizations we actually have updated on our website every day. I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's in the that's in the box where we list the number of cases and the number of uh, deaths, etc. I, I just don't have the number off the top of my head. We've been, I can tell you that we've been at zero to two for uh, a number of weeks now, per day. Uh, I, yeah, I'm looking at the total up, up until, you know, for the first seven months, the total amount. Uh, yeah. Perhaps I just missed it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Avery Powell, WCAX. Dr. Levine, if um, travel is one of the sources of infection here, does that indicate that travelers aren't following protocols? Um, and did the travelers who got infected follow the quarantine, or is there really any way to know that? <clears throat> so, obviously it's possible that that's true. Um, we don't have firm data to really help us with that. I am aware that a uh, reporter for a national newspaper was wondering the same and did an informal survey. Uh, and that will probably be reported. Uh, I don't know what the results of the survey, that's why I'm not giving you any more information. Um, whether that sort of attempt is going to give us accurate data is, is doubtful, but it will give us an idea just of interviews of people who visited here over the uh, foliage season. But that's uh, all I can tell you. We, you know, if we listen to Dr. Burks, um, she was most concerned about people traveling for family occasions, things of that sort, who would either be going from your state to another state to be with their family or um, going having family come to the state uh, and thinking because they were trusted and uh, so familiar that they would be safe with regard to COVID. And um, <clears throat> her information was that that is not true and that was a major uh, cause of some of the surges in other states. Okay, um, and just another question for Governor Scott. Can I, just, can I just interrupt you for one second, Avery? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Guy Page's numbers, since I'm sure people have been waiting with bated breath to, to hear that. And we looked at our website on the weekly update ending October 7th, and there were 142 hospitalizations recorded since the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Sorry to interrupt, and please ask your next question. That's okay. Um, Governor Scott, as I'm sure you've heard yesterday, there was a shooting in Bay Area. Berlin police officer um, shot and killed a woman and then unfortunately himself. Does this raise alarms for you about the mental health of police officers and the protocols that they have as um, being reported? He was also on duty during this time. Yeah, obviously a tragic situation for all involved. And, uh, and I live in Berlin as well, and I'm from this area. Um, so my thoughts uh, go out to the, to the victim. Um, but uh, I don't have any more information uh, than you probably do at this point in time. Um, this is part of the investigation to find out what happened. I, I might refer to Commissioner Sherling if he's on. I know that they're uh, going to have uh, some sort of briefing uh, sometime today uh, to bring everyone up to speed. But if there's anything he might be able to offer in this regard at this point. Something that has been front and center for uh, many years now. Uh, we're continuing to build out resources uh, with member assistance teams and contracted psychologists to ensure that all of our first responders, whether they're in policing, emergency medical services, the fire service, or emergency management, have uh, ongoing and robust access to those services as they face the pressures of their jobs. Uh, it is too early to tell um, what if any impact those kinds of programs uh, could have had in this particular case, as the governor said, it's very early on. And we do anticipate uh, a briefing later on today by the state police uh, with additional detail uh, that may become available around the case itself. Thank you. Jill Lee Sherman, Local 22, Local 44. Hi. Um, it was mentioned that transmission in, um, there, to date, there has been no transmission in the school. Um, I wanted to know how we know that. And um, my second question, I just as UVM students are tested every week, um, I wanted to know if that's something elementary, middle, and high schools um, can adopt or are considering to adopt. Um, yeah. That's the be. Yeah, thanks for those questions. So the way we know um, is that um, 
obviously when we know of a case, we do all of our interviewing and then we contact Trace and when appropriate, tell whatever element of the faculty, staff and students might need to quarantine. Um, so the way we would know if there was ongoing transmission within the school is if other cases showed up um, that would have you know, potentially been exposed to the uh, index case. A number of our index cases actually weren't in school when they were infectious, so that's easy. Others may have been in school for a day or two when they were infectious, uh, but we, we know through the contact tracing process who we need to be concerned about and who not. Um, and the schools pretty uniformly, you know, have been able to operate. I think early on um, they were much more conservative as they should be because most schools had never seen a case and didn't know exactly how their protocols would play out. Um, so they may have stayed closed for a day or two uh, while they were sorting things out or longer depending on if there were too many uh, teachers that were quarantined and couldn't possibly do their jobs uh, effectively in the school setting. Uh, but the majority of the schools, uh, especially with these recent cases we've been discussing, have all been able to continue operations per usual. Um, and so far, we have not seen transmission within a school. Um, and when it comes to testing students weekly, is that something the school decides? So with the colleges, that was a, uh, if you will, a prerequisite to their being able to uh, come back and reopen and uh, have in-person instruction occur. Um, and as you know, with the colleges, um, except for some of the smaller Vermont sites, there are many schools in Vermont that have many students who come from out of state um, and zones that are hotter than uh, Vermont is. What we thought about with the elementary and high school populations is again that they are all Vermonters. They're not coming from a, uh, uh, Boston to attend our schools in Vermont uh, predominantly. So most of them being Vermonters, they looked like the rest of Vermont when it came to their uh, prevalence or their amount of COVID that they uh, would actually harbor. So we did not feel that there was a necessity for an extensive testing protocol. But again, what we said and we continue to say is everybody who attends those schools at every level from student on through staff and faculty are parts of communities in Vermont. So as long as those communities remain with such a low prevalence of virus as you saw on our update this week again, um, did not seem that a testing protocol was going to be necessary. Obviously, if the state changed dramatically, uh, that would be a very, very, very different story. But for this point in time, there was no need to make testing a prerequisite to the opening of schools. And now we've been through how many weeks? Uh, many, many weeks. Um, certainly over a month now. Um, and I guess it provides some um, evidence that if we uh, had done testing, it wouldn't have made a difference because we've had so few cases, especially when you looked at what Commissioner Pichak showed uh, compared to even adjoining states. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that goes over time. That's why we watch all of these metrics very closely, literally daily. Well, thank you. Um, I, if I can, I just wanted to clarify something Dr. Burke uh, said over the weekend. Um, she mentioned stopping this violent spread and said that much of what we saw in the spring is likely to happen as we enter the fall and winter months. Um, what did we do in April um, and in the spring that um, might have caused spikes in cases and um, how might we exhibit those behaviors going forward? So, so the date of our stay home, stay safe was approximately March 24th, I believe. And it lasted a month. So it went through April. Um, 
So we certainly didn't see a spike in cases then. The spike preceded that, and then it receded uh, since that time. And at, as we came out of that, and as the governor started opening the spigot, um, we were at a place of viral suppression that was pretty profound. There were very, very um, few cases. And uh, Commissioner Pichak again showed his curve uh, today, showing the modest increase we've had in the last couple of weeks compared to sometime in June. But then when you compare that to that initial part in March and April, uh, it looks like nothing because it was such a high peak at that point in time. So we did not see any spikes um, in the uh, numbers of cases once we were in and coming out of the stay home, stay safe uh, posture that we were, we were in back in the spring. The fear that I'm sure she's uh, discussing, um, Deborah Burks, uh, and that we've discussed every week is just the need to go indoors when the weather changes and it gets colder. Um, and will that just have people together too much in too uh, restrictive a setting to allow people who have virus but don't know they have it to transmit it more widely? Um, and we didn't actually go through a full winter before. You know, the virus arrived here in March. Our first case was March 7th, I believe. And uh, we didn't have November, December, January, February, uh, times when it does get uh, colder in Vermont and people are less likely to be doing the things outdoors that they do now. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Andrew McGregor, the Caledonian Record. Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I see uh, on the travel map that Commissioner PCX um, presented a little earlier, Grafton County just turned to yellow. Um, and a number of our border communities are intertwined with uh, the towns right across the river. Just curious, uh, I know most of this is online, but you know, for the benefit of um, listeners and our readers, what are the expectations uh, for, for people who routinely work, shop, recreate, visit family um, uh, when counties turn yellow? And in instances when this has happened in the past, do you find that Vermonters comply with, with the sudden shift in, in the expectation? Um, we would ask that they be uh, more vigilant, um, be more uh, careful, and we're not limiting when they're on the borders like that, uh, as was uh, previous uh, to the order. Uh, we allowed for shopping uh, in the, these counties across the across the border, and if you work uh, either in in Vermont or New Hampshire uh, or New York, for that matter, uh, back and forth, uh, you can continue to work. So, again, it's about <clears throat> adhering to the guidance, and if. Uh, if, uh, if you can remain where you are, we would advise to do so uh, to prevent the spread or the transmission back and forth. How about activities that aren't, aren't necessarily essential, like uh, work and shopping for, um, for food and whatnot? How about yeah. family visits, recreation, things like that? Yeah, again, <clears throat> we would ask that you not, uh, not uh, do that, uh, you know, not visit back and forth. Um, anything that uh, can be prevented, uh, we would ask you to adhere to the guidelines. Okay, and uh, if I may, um, uh, for uh, Commissioner Levine, um, curious a little bit about the, um, the outbreak within the hockey community. Do you know at this point um, uh, the breakdown of cases among adults versus youth? Um, how many teams might have been impacted on the youth organization? And uh, do you see this having an impact on uh, winter sports guidance that's being developed right now? Yeah, so right now there's um, about twice as many adults as youth. I'm not sure about the breakdown of teams at this point. And I would hate at, on this day of the week to say that this has a major impact on our discussions about winter sports guidance. Uh, we need to probe a little further into this and understand it better. Um, I want to remind everyone that the youth hockey recreational leagues started way back in the summer 
they've been going on a long time. The track record has been really good. Now we have some cases, so we have to understand them better. But it certainly isn't a reason to say, uh, we draw the line here, winter sports seasons are canceled. That would not be the appropriate response. So you need to give us a little more time to understand that. Um, and all of the groups of us that are talking about uh, winter sports um, continue to have the same exact conversations, not overshadowed by this by any means, um, because basically deciding the kinds of guidance that need to be appropriately put out um, is, is a process that should continue to go on and is based in sound public health and uh, other, fa other rationales. So we'll just have to learn more about uh, what's gone on this time around. Okay, thank you very much. Steve Merrill. Can you hear me? I can. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, a quick one for the Governor and maybe a couple for the doctor, if I may. Um, as Governor, on the state's largest daily paper, and we saw this all over the net on the weekend, uh, it looks like the uh, WHO has done a complete about face regarding lockdowns. Um, uh, it, is this uh, well, it, it, have you thought about this? Will this affect any, the way we do anything here? I'm, I'm going to refer that one to the uh, to Dr. Levine as well. You know, I haven't actually read the WHO's uh, statement. I've, I keep hearing about it all the time, uh, so I'd like to look at it in more detail. Uh, all I can say is. Um, what we did worked, and we didn't have to maintain that posture for a tremendously long period of time. Um, so you know, can just base it on our local data. Uh, I, I would hate to think we would have to engage in lockdowns ever again, so I understand where they're coming from. Uh, they're very disruptive to everyone. Uh, they're very disruptive to the economy. They're very disruptive to people's uh, emotional and mental well-being. Uh, so there's certainly plenty of concerns we can have. Um, but I have to really read more from what their rationale was uh, to really help answer the, your question um, more effectively. Uh, sure, maybe by Friday. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, um, were you health commissioner uh, during the prior administration? No, I was appointed to uh, be health commissioner by Governor Scott. Okay. Um, I had a question from a viewer who saw you on, uh, on WCAX, said that you supported the uh, BHS uh, closure due to PCBs, and uh, they were wondering um, um, why we're not testing all the other uh, schools in Vermont. That, uh, that were built around the same time. And a quick follow-up after that. Sure. So back in 2013, in 2014, there was a pilot done of several schools in Vermont, not a very large number. And actually, the PCB levels came back uh, within the limits we would want them to. They were not. Um, concerning. So the first time we've had an experience with this is Burlington High School, where in one of the buildings, uh, the numbers were extraordinarily high, much more than all of the other buildings. But the buildings were all higher than our uh, value that we act on. So needless to say, that's generated a tremendous amount of discussion amongst lots of parties about people in various sectors in state government, parents of children, students themselves, uh, community members, you name it. Um, everyone's now at least got this on their radar screen. So we are 
actively discussing what our posture should be and how we should approach the future with regard to the other schools. Um, and so that just, you know, it's happened so quickly in the midst of a pandemic. Um, we certainly uh, didn't want to make a rash decision uh, and we want to approach it like we do anything else from a health point of view and from an education point of view, which is to have all our facts and really um, make sure we've covered all bases as we think about this. So it doesn't no, mean from a, we, from a yeah. Sure, but from a from a health point of view, and this really bothered a lot of people at the time. Um, the the state uh, had a, e a, a allowable E. coli level of uh, beach, uh, beach closures and river closures uh, for swimming and stuff at 77 parts per thousand and uh, the state just turned around and uh, just instead of using our standard they went to the federal standard of 235 per thousand um, I hope that's not something we're considering or is it uh, when it comes to PCBs no with PCBs our standard is far stricter Yeah, as it once was with E. coli, but they changed that. Can't comment on the anyway. process that went through with E. coli, but certainly for this, our stance is much stricter. Much more similar to what we did with lead in the drinking water in schools, uh, where we had a much stricter posture, and now we find many other states are actually adopting our posture as they look at that problem in their own settings. Yeah, it would be nice if we could go back to our old standards with regard to E. coli, but that's neither here nor there. All right, um, thank you both very much. Joel Baird, Burlington Free Press. Joel, the Burlington Free Press. Star six to unmute. everyone. That's it. All right. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday uh, for the education update. Thank you.